just to say, okay, I am also going to put on the closed captions. Know that these captions are done by AI. So if a word is mispronounced or it's not the correct word, please charge it to the AI and not the speaker or myself. Uh, that is all technology is doing. And with that, I'm so excited to introduce our speaker, Mustafa Bayoni, is the author of the critically acclaimed, How Does It Feel to Be a Problem? Being Young and Arab in America, which won an American Book Award and the Arab American Book Award for nonfiction, and the author of This Muslim American Life, Dispatches from the War on Terror, which was also awarded the Arab American Book Award for Nonfiction. Mustafa is also a columnist for The Guardian and a regular contributor to The Nation. His writings have appeared in The New York Times, New York Magazine, The Daily Beast, CNN.com, The London Review of Books, The Chronicle of Higher Education, The Progressive, and so many more places. He is a professor of English at Brooklyn College, City University of New York, where he spends his time in New York. I am so excited to introduce to you all our speaker for today, Mustafa. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Brett. And I just want to tell you that I am so thankful for this very kind and, and really, really warm invitation that I've gotten from you and from from Compass Family Services. What an honor it is really for me to speak to you today and to be affiliated with such an important and historic and storied organization that's dedicated to social justice, to economic justice and to racial and ethnic justice. And I really wanna commend you for all of your valuable efforts for the whole organization. And I'm delighted to shine a light on you as much as I can. And today on uh, Arab Americans uh, and our presence here, our history, uh, and maybe even something about our future. And as you said, Rhett, uh, this is Arab American Heritage Month. We have still, oh, just under a week left of this month, and uh, which is, of course, a time to celebrate our history um, in this country, to honor our achievements. So I thought it might be actually be a bit of, you know, it might be a little bit fun today if we start off with, let's do a little quiz on Arab American history. And let's see what people know and what they don't know. Uh, this is a population that's upwards of maybe 4 million people in the United States. Um, and uh, well, let's let's just dive right in. And don't worry, no one but you will know how well you've done. Okay, so let's start. I'm going to give you 10 questions and we'll just do a one, one, one on uh, um, each one after the other. So in the first question, in the United States today, and just yell out your answers or, or should put them in chat or raise your hands. Let's, we're all friends here. In the United States today, are there more Arab American Muslims or Arab American Christians? Anyone? Oh, we're getting multiple responses, I see. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump right in and give you the answer. The answer is Christians by still a substantial number, okay? We'll get into that history in a little bit. Number two, approximately when did Arab Americans begin arriving in significant numbers on the shores of the United States? Can you give me say a decade? Anybody have any idea? Nineteen sixties, nineteen thirties, nineteen twenties. I'm hearing or seeing twenties. Um, the answer is longer than you, you're suggesting. Actually, it's the eighteen nineties. In the eighteen nineties. Okay, number three. Which Arab American poet authored one of the best-selling books of all time? This one people will know. I think. I'm guessing maybe. At one point, it was it was only uh, it, it, the only book that had sold more copies was the Bible. This is the book that made Alfred A. Knopf famous and rich. And his name is Khalil Gibran. 
You know that book, The Prophet? Yeah. Okay. Number four, name the Arab American actor who played Freddie Mercury in the 2018 film, Bohemian Rhapsody. Yes, there we go. I, I had a feeling that one was gonna, that one was gonna score some points. Okay. Number Rami Malik, of course. Rami Malik is Egyptian American from a Coptic background. And in fact, sometimes Copts uh, will, uh, sometimes will, will be, consider themselves part of the Arab, larger Arab family. Sometimes they won't. Arab, to be an Arab is a complicated identity. Number five, who, can anybody name the first women's studies professor at Harvard Divinity School? It's a little esoteric, I guess. But her name is Leila Ahmed, okay, also Egyptian American. Number six, a famous Arab American has been a visionary consumer advocate and four time presidential candidate. Can you name him? Oh, did I miss the chat? Can you name him? Yes, exactly. Ralph Nader. Well done. Um, Lebanese, uh, Lebanese descent. Uh, number seven. This Arab American scientist broke the story about the Flint, Michigan water crisis. Can you name her? Can you name her? It's a little bit more obscure, I suppose. Her name is Dr. Munna Hanna Atisha, okay, from an Iraqi background. Her book on the Flint water crisis is called What the Eyes Don't See and was named the New York Times 100 Notable Books of 2018 and one of the best science books of 2018 by NPR. Okay, number eight. What major international award did the Arab American chemistry professor Ahmed Zawail win in 1999? I think major awards for chemistry. And the answer is yes, the Nobel Prize. Thank you, Brent. <laughs> and uh, number nine. This artist sang the first ever set in Arabic at this year's Coachella Festival. Can you name her? Yes, right away, Spencer gets it. Ileana, right. And she lives now, I believe, in California. Chilean Palestinian uh, artist. And number 10, this man served as US Senator from South Dakota, gained renown for his championing of Native American rights, and founded the leading national civil rights organizations for Arab Americans. And he passed away this year at the age of 92. I wonder if anybody can name him. Any guesses? I guess it's hard to guess. Uh, his name is James Abu Rizq. He was elected to the United States uh, as a US representative from South Dakota in 1970, and then served in that role for one term then was a, US state, a United States Senator from South Dakota from 72 until 78. And he wrote or was instrumental in passing the Indian Child Welfare Act, the Indian Self-Determination Act and the Indian Religious Freedom Act. And, and in 1980, he founded the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, which is still around to this day. So that's just a little quick quiz to see where people uh, think about their knowledge on all things Arab American. I think, I think you could see that we have a long and rich uh, history here that some of these indications, some of these questions would indicate. Um, Arab Americans, you know, have uh, been here really for the, 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 the great length of the time that uh, uh, this country has been around even longer, in fact. Arab Americans fought in the Revolutionary War. There was a private Nathan Badin from Syria who died fighting the British in the Revolutionary War. Arab Americans uh, were also coming to the United States with the rise of the world's fairs. You know, in the 19th century and up until the early 20th century, they used to have these world's fairs that were these, uh, these you know, big costume dramas and pageantries of like uh, different places in the world. And in fact, they would have camels and date palms and, and you know, uh, in fact, dates, dates in California come also from Arab Americans. Those are uh, Iraqi immigrants came back in the early part of the 20th century and planted dates in California. Um, uh, not only that, 
if you already were predisposed to like Arab Americans, I'm gonna tell you one fact now that's just gonna make you love Arab Americans. And that is that Arab, an, Arab, an Arab American is responsible for the ice cream cone. Yes, that is right. So what, and in fact, it was invented at the 1904 World's Fair. What happened was there was a man selling ice cream uh, and then beside him was uh, another man named uh, Ernest Hamwi who was making zabaliya, which are like these, like almost like waffle cone kind of pastry things. And then the man selling the ice cream had run out of little cups to put his ice cream in. And so Ernst Hamley had an idea. He's like, well, why don't I just make one of my little, little pastries in the shape of a cone and we can put the ice cream inside there. And after that, all I can say is you're welcome very much. Yes. Um, but in fact, Arab American history really didn't start getting going until the 19, 1890s, 1880s, 1890s, as I was describing then. The, uh, during that period of time, the Ottoman Empire was collapsing. Silk routes were changing, you know, where they were getting, these used to be the, that uh, a lot of Europe uh, silk manufacturers would get their silk from the Fertile Crescent area. And as there was, there was the, uh, the, the, the Suez Canal was built and there was more traffic over to East Asia, the whole nature of where silk was coming from changed uh, globally. The global economy was part of this, uh, this story as well. So what that meant was that whole villages, entire villages would get up and move, many from the Mount, Eben, Le Mount Lebanon area, um, others from the broader Levant area at that time. From, so so uh, we would get Palestinians, what we would today call Palestinians, Jordanians, Lebanese, Syrians, all coming to the United States around that time. Many of them were called in their immigration documents, would have been called Turks actually, because they were considered to be Ottoman subjects. So historians have to go back sometimes and, and look through the names and look through the specific migration patterns to figure out exactly where they're coming from and whether they were ethnically, say, Turkish or ethnically Arab, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes they might have also been called Syrian, which can also refer to the idea of a greater Syria, which would often include today uh, much of the Levant, certainly Syria and Lebanon. Back in the 1880s and 1890s, they moved first to New York. New York was the mother colony, but they also moved, they actually called it the mother colony, but they also moved to places like Boston and Detroit um, uh, and other places around the country. And in those early years, the thing that mostly uh, uh, employed many of the new Arab migrants into the United States was pack peddling. I don't know if you know what pack peddling refers to, but or if you're ever familiar with the, the old, there's an old musical uh, called Oklahoma. I don't know if you remember that musical, but there's a character in that musical in Oklahoma by the name of Ali Hakim. It's not a musical that actually I'm very familiar with, but Ali Hakim is supposed to be a Persian character, but he still reflects the early Arab American professions and Middle Eastern American stereotypes in that show anyways. But he's a pack peddler, somebody who would just put all their wares on their pack and they would go from town to town and sell things from uh, to community to community. And in fact, that's the or original history of a lot of the Arab American community. They would travel across the entire country and they would sell a lot of their goods and wares, uh, especially they would, they would sell a lot actually to African American communities uh, because African American communities would not have access you know, um, um, to a lot of the big stores and things like that. Um, um, during segregation and these, these and Jim Crow era. And so this is, this is another ways in which these histories are commingling co and intermingling. But New York City was still the center of the Arab American world, especially the area between Washington Street and Rector Street in lower Manhattan. And in fact, it's one of the ironies that that is an area that's maybe one, one block away from where the World Trade Center used to be. That area was called Little Syria. Here's an 1890 New York Times article describing uh, Washington Street in Little Syria. Okay, I'm just gonna quote a little bit from it. Here's what they say. It says, the foreign population, you can tell already where this is going. The foreign population in the lower part of this city has of late years been increased by the Arabic speaking element from the Lebanon in Syria. In clannishness and outlandish manners, these people resemble the Chinese and what are called the Diego Italians. I'm just reading what I'm, read, uh, what I'm, you know, what I'm seeing here. I'm not making any of this up. 
Nearly all of them are Maronite Christians. And in many respects, they are inferior to the Chinese and Italians who do possess a certain amount of self-respect and are willing to work honestly and work hard for a living. Whoa, that's the New York Times back in 1890. You know, we, we talk differently, I think, about our, uh, our country and, and the people who make it up to these days. The New York community though, had a lot of energy. They, they wrote a lot, they made a lot of newspapers, they made a lot of poetry, they made a lot of art, they made a lot of music, they made a lot of food and industry, much of it in textiles. You know, in between New York and Boston was this group called the Penn League, which was a group of, a group of writers, which included someone like Khalil Gibran, whose book, The Prophet, Outsold, was outsold only by the Bible at the time, as I was mentioning earlier. New migrants trickled off after 1924. So between 1880 and 1924 is when you start to get a lot of um, um, people coming into the country. But after 1924, you basically get these nativist, very exclusive, very anti-immigrant laws in this country that are passed that uh, also they shut down the, the door on Asian migration into the country. You know, you've heard of Chinese exclusion laws, for example. This, they've, they've expanded all the way to, to um, mean that almost nobody can enter the country who's not from Northern Europe between 1924 and 1965. And so from 1890 until 1924, you had a sizable migration that then slows down to just a, a trickle and then starts up again after 1965 when the immigration laws change. At that point, many more become many more people begin coming, some for education, others for opportunity. They were fleeing war or seeking refuge to be reunited with family and friends, all of that sort of stuff, right? By the time we get to the 1970s, you have, for example, you have a lot of Arab Americans who are very instrumental in, in the auto industry. In fact, uh, that's why you, you, know, you might know today that the city that has the largest concentration of Arab Americans in the United States is in Dearborn, Michigan. The reason why they're in Dearborn, Michigan was because they worked on the Ford uh, uh, line. In fact, um, the, uh, the Ford Chrysler, um, and uh, General Motors all had sizable Arab American populations who are working on their lines in, in the Detroit area. Hamtramck today is a, is a majority Muslim town actually too. And that was a GM town, I think it was GM. And um, also what happened in the 1970s was uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, something that's California related since I'll bring it up since we're talking to people here in California, which was, uh, you know, the, um, the organizing of the of the um, agricultural industry with Cesar Chavez, for example, right? And in fact, what's little known about that is that Yemeni pickers were also in the Central Valley and they were also involved in organizing farm workers in the 1970s. One of them, in fact, was this man by the name of Nagy Daifallah, who was an organizer with, and who was killed by a deputy sheriff in Lamont, California during the Great Picker Strike of 1973. So again, Arab Americans have actually been deeply involved in every part of our history. And yet for some reason, we're actually, we don't, we know, I mean, the reason is there was a small population for one thing, but we generally tend not to know, I think that much about Arab Americans and yet we should. Now there's certainly the fate and fortunes of Arab Americans have waxed and waned over the years. But certainly, but September, 2001 marked a particularly difficult time one that we are still dealing with today, more than 20 years later. In fact, I would say that, you know, probably most people knew nothing about Arab Americans before 9-11, most people. And after 9-11, I would probably say they knew even less, to be honest with you. They knew that we were, they knew us just as a group that maybe needed to be spied upon. Right, a group that wasn't to be trusted. The climate since 9-11 has been one of suspicion. We went from being you know, kind of in the shadows to being in the spotlight, as I've written before, right? But somehow from the shadows to the spotlight, you still don't see the details of everyday life, right? The spotlight will shine off all of the details of how people actually live. 
And the climate since 9-11 has been one of suspicion, of not belonging in this country, one of hatred, one of violence. And even, I would say, of instrumentalizing our simple presence here and our difference into a political issue of the most cynical kind. I mean, just think about the ways that um, politicians have talked about Arab Americans, for example. And a lot of it is done out of a great deal of ignorance. You know, many Americans, I think, probably still continue to say, to mix up, for example, Arabs and Muslims. They still mix them up as two different things. I mean, I'm, I know I'm talking to a learned audience here, but I'll give you an example. I, I think you might remember if, you have, if you're um, at least a little bit older than I don't know, 25 or something. Back in 2008, do you remember John McCain was running um, against Barack Obama for the presidency? And there was a town hall meeting and he was running around with his microphone, you know, from person to person. And then he, there's a, a, a woman who's going to ask a question. And so he puts the microphone in her, in her, um, um, by her so she can ask her question. And her question was, she starts off and she says, I don't like Obama. And then John McCain was like, yes, 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 yes. And then the woman then says, I don't like him. Yes, yes. And then she says, he's an Arab. I don't know if you remember that moment in time, right? And then at which point John McCain then goes, yeah, no, 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 no. And he gets very, very nervous and very upset, right? And then he immediately steps back and he says, no, ma'am, he's a decent family man, a citizen. As if you can't be an Arab and a decent family man and a citizen, that seemed to be sort of the implication of what McCain was also saying at the time. But of course, that woman, I think, was also mixing up the idea that Obama was either a Muslim. Uh, I don't think she was thinking he was an Arab. She was thinking of him as a Muslim. There was a lot of talk that he was a secret Muslim. You know, his middle name is Hussein and all of that sort of stuff already at that time, right? And so there's this, this has long been this confusion between who are Arabs and who are Muslims. And, you know, maybe it's not that difficult to understand that confusion because Arab and Muslim are two essentially overlapping categories, right? It's like, remember high school? You remember those Venn diagrams? Like that's one way of thinking about Arab as one circle and Muslim as another, and they overlap. So not everybody who's Arab is Muslim, not everybody who's Muslim is Arab, obviously. And of course, it's also made even more difficult because in the rest of the world, there are more uh, uh, in Muslim Arabs than Christian Arabs, right? In the Arab world, it's about 85% Muslim, 15% Christian-ish, 15, around 15%. And then there, of course, there are also Arab, Arab Jews, there are Arab atheists, you know, uh, to be Arab also does not include a racial category. You have white Arabs, you have black Arabs, you have brown Arabs, they have, they, it's the full mix, right? It's a very complicated category. But in the United States, it's almost the opposite, right? In the United States, instead, we have more Arab Christians owing largely to that early wave of migration that I was talking about in the beginning. Then we have Arab Muslims, probably around, it used to be two thirds of the population of Arab Americans were Christian and one third Muslim. We've gotten a little bit more Muslims in the meantime, but still it's heavily uh, uh, Christian um, and not nearly as much Muslim. And of course, in the Muslim world, it's also really complicated because most Arabs are a minority globally in the Muslim world. Not every Muslim is an Arab. In fact, Anybody can tell me what the most populous Muslim country in the world is? Any ideas? Indonesia, correct. Yes, that's right, right? Not an Arab country, right? And then maybe it's um, Pakistan, then maybe India, and then maybe Turkey. You know, an Arab country, Egypt, wouldn't show up until fourth, fifth, uh, sixth along the list. Uh, so Arabs are a minority of the Muslim population globally. And then in the United States, the Muslim history in the United States is itself another category that is completely fascinating. And one I think that we always have to pay attention to, especially in an era of heightened Islamophobia, right? So we can have Arabophobia and we can have Islamophobia and those two things can commingle and, and, and sometimes they can even trade places with each other and the effect is the same. But it's important to understand that Muslim history in this country goes all the way back 
at least uh, older than the country itself, at least to the days of slavery, right? Because you had people who were enslaved in this country, who were stolen from Africa, brought to this country in chains, who themselves were Muslim in faith and belief. In fact, that history is itself an incredibly interesting one, one that involves uh, people retaining their faith uh, against all odds and being able to write out Qurans by memory. You know, we have we have all kinds of stories from historians that have found, for example, you know, one historian went through all of the different um, official records in South Carolina, colonial South Carolina, where there was a black majority for a long time. In colonial South Carolina, he writes in one of his articles, he says, in colonial South Carolina, the name Mustafa was a fairly common name. I remember when I read that, I thought, wait a sec, that's my name. Right, so this is an idea. This this notion that Islam somehow arrived on the shores of the United States on 9/11 or the week before 9/11 and has since become a new and dangerous. That's just completely ahistorical to what our actual history is, and the relationship between Islam and um, uh, Arab American history is also one that is, is deeply interesting and deeply involved. I mean, Muslims in this country come from not just Arab countries, but they come from 77 different countries of, from across the world. It's the most ethnically uh, diverse religious community in the United States. And some of them, the history goes all the way back to the days of slavery, as I was saying, and goes all the way right up to, I mean, if you ask the most, uh, you know, prior to 9-11, if you'd ask your average person, name a famous Muslim in the United States, I bet you that they would have said someone like Malcolm X or Muhammad Ali. And you would have seen that Islam would have been, had been associated with the black freedom struggle. Now, after 9-11, that narrative has shifted. For the last 20 years, you talk about Islam in the United States and you think about a dangerous brown-skinned immigrant instead, right? And I think it's important to pay attention to ways in which history is complicated, that our history uh, gets simplified for ideological purposes instead. And let's instead uh, celebrate and honor the complexity of American history and understand uh, also the ways in which the ideological uses of identity can have these dangerous impacts on people's lives. And one way that that has happened since 9-11, for example, was a massive rise in hate crimes right after 9-11. For example, there was about an 1800%, 1,800% rise in hate crimes in the first six months after 9-11 against Arab Americans, as was documented. And not only that, but uh, that number, it went way up and then it went down and then it stayed low, relatively low for quite a while until around 2015. And of course we know what happened in 2015. And so with the rise, of Donald Trump and that kind of rhetoric coming back into our political sphere, we saw hate crimes against both Arabs and Muslims start to spike again. And in fact, they, they um, spiked above the category, above the number that hate crimes had been uh, happening even at the time of 9-11 with the rise of Donald Trump. Then we get things like the Muslim ban as well. We get you know all of these kinds of, of um, uh, politically motivated uses of an of a Arab American and Muslim American identity that is, yes, I will just borrow Spencer's word, uh, completely horrifying. And a lot of that happened um, it, uh, uh, since 9-11. I mean, we're talking now about the period most specifically around the time of Donald Trump, but I think it's also important to understand that Donald Trump did not come out of nowhere. In a lot of ways, Donald Trump spoke the kinds of rhetorics that a lot of people thought, but thought it would be also too impolite to say, right? And we have polling data that will indicate that a lot of that is true. So what happened with, with me as someone who's a, a writer who's living in New York City, and I lived in New York City even at the time of 9-11 and have lived here since, is that I saw the effects that 9-11 was having on the Arab American community, on the Muslim American community, on these overlapping categories. Here, close up, I saw it firsthand. And at, at, there was a time when I thought then that I was looking for uh, uh, those kinds of stories to be told in the media, in our sort of national consciousness. What I was witnessing instead was a kind of progressive dehumanization of the Arab and Muslim communities. Um, and, uh, you know, 
so that you would start to see all these polls that were coming out. And every time that there was a, an election, in fact, what's really interesting is that you would get more uh, negative polling around uh, Arab Americans and Muslim Americans, not when there was, say, a horrific terrorist attack somewhere in the country or in the world. No, in fact, you would get more negative polling when there was a national election in the United States. Just to illustrate once again, the ways in which our identities have become politically useful for some people. But what it did, what all that did was it washed out what the real details were of people's lives. So there, were, there came a point where I thought, well, if I'm not gonna be reading those stories the way that I want them to be read. In that case, I think instead what I wanna do is I wanna write them and then maybe other people will be able to read them. And that's what I did. So I went around and I thought, you know, uh, I'm gonna tell the stories of young Arab Americans all from Brooklyn. And I thought it would be really interesting to tell the stories of young people because young people are always in that moment, even without a national catastrophe or you know, all the weight of a society on your shoulders. As a young person, you're always trying to figure out what your way in the world is, what your identity is, who you are, what your values are. How do you separate yourself from your parents, for example? How do you understand how people understand you? All of those questions are really fraught questions when you're a young person. And they become even more fraught when you do have all of this newfound uh, social hostility that's weighing on your shoulders. And not only that, but even you know a lot of scrutiny and, and surveillance from the, from the national uh, government at the same time, the federal government. So I told the stories of seven different young people in, in the book. Yes, if you see back there or here, how does it feel to be a problem being young and Arab in America? And um, I won't have time to give you a, a sense of all of the stories, but maybe I'll just tell you a couple of the different stories that are in the book. So one story, for example, concerns the story of Russia. Russia at the time uh, when 9-11 um, happened, she was about 19 years old. And she had come with her family from Syria. And she'd lived in the United States since she was about five years old. But when they first arrived in the United States, they didn't arrive, they arrived on tourist visas and immediately claimed asylum, right? This was the, under Hafez al-Assad's uh, government in Syria. Russia's father uh, felt that the family was not safe in Syria and he, he sought asylum in the United States. So for 14 years, Russia had been living in this moment where they're still having their asylum case adjudicated. I don't know how many of you have any, had any dealings with uh, the federal government, especially around asylum, but if you have, then you'll know that it can take years and years and years for those claims to be heard. Not only does it take very long, but at one point Russia and her family had left the country and then they came back. And so that means they have to start up all over again at the same time too. Right. And so they weren't living, they weren't, you know, so called, you know, um, undocumented that actually the federal government had all their documentation, right? That there's that their case had not been heard, had not been fully adjudicated. They were living in this sort of liminal gray zone. It's a zone that millions of people actually live in every single day in this country. And it's a vulnerable place to exist. But they were making the best of it. In fact, Russia's father had worked through a whole bunch of different jobs, and Russia had gone to high school in New York City, she, her New York City life was the, pretty much the only life that she knew. Um, Russia's father had finally saved up enough money to buy the family a small house and they were working um, on, uh, in Brooklyn at the time of 9-11. About six months after 9-11, Russia and her sister are asleep in their bedroom. They shared a bedroom at the time. Suddenly, Russia feels somebody shaking her shoulder and she looks up to see who it is. And, uh, and she sees a woman in a uniform and the woman is saying to her, wake up, get dressed and go downstairs. Wake up, get dressed and go downstairs. Russia has no idea what's going on. She turns to her sister, her sister looks at her, she also has no idea. They're like, what is happening? And the woman won't tell them anything. She just says, get dressed and go downstairs. They think somebody maybe from the family has died, they don't know. So she gets up and she gets dressed. They go downstairs and they see the rest of her family's already lined up on the sofa. Her, her younger brother uh, is shackled already at this point. And um, there are, all kinds of official looking people with um, you know, an alphabet soup of letters on their backs uh, walking around. And one man who seems to be more in charge comes up to the family and says, we're investigating you on suspicion of terrorism. We're gonna take you downtown. 
We're going to uh, question you individually, and then we we know what your immigration status is, and so we're going to uh, detain you, and then most likely you're going to be deported. And they're like, "What is going on?" They had no idea what was going on, and they, that's exactly what happened. They got separated as a family, and they were each one was asked what Rasha says were very pro forma questions, like they showed a picture of Osama bin Laden and said, "Do you know this man?" She's like, "Are you kidding me?" Right? Just most ridiculous things. And then um, they separated the men from the women and the minors from the majors, right? Russia even had two younger brothers who had been born in the United States over those years. So they were American citizens. So the, in fact, the authorities did not take them into uh, uh, um, uh, custody. And Russia's father said, let me just call my brother. He lives in Chicago. He'll get in his car right now. He'll drive here by the morning so he can take, take my two sons. And the authorities said, nope, nope. Just leave him with the tenants downstairs. We're leaving right now. And then they took him downtown, questioned each of them individually, and then separated. And Drasha and her sister and her mother went to an immigration detention at Bergen County Jail in New Jersey. And then they essentially just disappeared off the face of the earth um, from the people who knew them. They didn't know what, nobody knew what happened to them. And for the next three months, they were moved from one prison to another at one point. But for the next three months, they were living in detention and they have no reason, no understanding why. And Russia was very, very upset about this. At first she gets very um, um, depressed and then she gets angry. She thinks this is not justice, this is revenge. Why is it that we are here? What happened in, that, if, in, in Russia's case eventually was that the fact that she had, she and her older sister, her older sister was a university student at this time, um, Russia had just entered university, was uh, her, some of the friends of her sister had been investigating her disappearance. And they knew that people were being swept off the streets because of 9-11. And so they started a petition campaign to try to find Russia. And also at the same time, you had lawyers who were hanging out in front of these prisons, asking people on the way out, who's in there with you? Because I don't know if you remember what happened right after 9-11, but the government usually will release the names of people they have arrested, but they did not release the names of people they had arrested after 9-11. So the lawyers would have to camp out in front of these prisons and ask people who used to be there, who was in there with you? And eventually they got connected with a lawyer without them even knowing about this. The lawyer came and represented them. And after about three months, they were just simply let back to resume their lives. And they went back to their home and Rasha says it was the eeriest thing she could imagine because they walked back into their house and it just looked exactly as they left it, just a thin layer of dust over everything. And at that point, she decided that she needed to do something so that nobody else would have to uh, suffer the same kind of fate. And that's when she started being interested in pursuing uh, a future in human rights. Or there's the story of Omar, for example. Omar was a young man who lived uh, also in Brooklyn. He's half Chilean, half Palestinian, I guess just like Ileana. Very talented young man, speaks uh, you know, English, Spanish, Arabic, lived, uh, you know, he, the family had lived in Chile for a little bit when he was younger, also in the West Bank. Um, and he was going to, um, finishing his undergraduate degree in communications. And he really wanted to be in the media. Right, and he thought, you know, what better person to be in the media than myself? You know, he's he's, he's trilingual. He's very uh, confident about the world. He knows how the world operates, and um, he also had another reason why he wanted to get a job in the media, and that is that he he knew who he wanted to marry. Right, there was another young Palestinian woman, Palestinian American woman that he wanted to marry, and if he wanted to get married, he needed to have a good career job so he could go to her parents and say, look, I am a highly respectable, you know, we're a young man who can support a family and you should let me and her get married, right? And so he had all these re reasons that he really needed to get a good job. And so one year he ends up interning for Al Jazeera, you know, the Arabic news channel. And this is uh, back at a time when Al Jazeera was not even yet in English. He was, at, he was uh, uh, interning with their UN division of the Arabic language uh, channel. And he was working with a very well-known journalist and he was help, helping set up all these interviews and like, you know, doing all kinds of background research on them. And he was, he got to meet Kofi Annan at a certain point and Condoleezza Rice and like, 
he's just really, he's like in the, in the world of the movers and shakers and really felt really confident about where he was going and how this is gonna all work out for him, right? And he's also just about to finish his degree. So as the internship, you know, it was one of these short-term internships, it concludes. And then he thinks, okay, well now I'm gonna start getting, a, I'm gonna look for a new, a real job, a career job. So he gets, a, a gets his um, resume all together and he starts sending out a bunch of uh, query letters to different media organizations. And he hears nothing. And he thinks, oh, well, that's odd. And then he sends out another batch of letters. And he's confident that something's gonna happen. And again, he hears nothing. He sends out even more, even, as he told me, even to Fox News, right? And he's waiting, wait, and, and still nothing. And he's starting to get really nervous about this and wondering why it doesn't work. And he can't figure it out. And he doesn't want to think that it's, that it's discrimination, right? But he doesn't know either. In fact, he actually is somebody who could walk through the world uh, his white skinned, you know, his Chilean background. He doesn't have to necessarily, his name maybe. At one point he's gonna get a summer job just for some, you know, pocket change and uh, with a family friend. And the family friend is looking over his resume at that time when they're looking at the summer job. And the family friend sees it on his resume, he lists El Jazeera. And she says to him, you know, Omar, you know, people hate El Jazeera. He's, he's, this is the pride and joy of his resume for this young man. And she says, if you really want to get a job, maybe you should just take that off of your resume. And so he was at that moment when I, when I was uh, talking to him for the book, you know, that, that's where he was. He, had to, he was trying to figure out what to do, what to do next. And it was such a difficult thing for him. And, you know, Omar's, Omar's uh, uh, anxieties are not misplaced. Around that same year, there was a group that's based in California, actually, called the Discrimination Resource Center. It's at, it, I think it's at uh, UC Berkeley. Um, it's at one of the UCs, anyways. And the Discrimination Resource Center did this study around this time. And they sent out 5,000 equally qualified resumes across the state of California. But they had test marketed the names of these resumes beforehand. The resumes were fake. There were actually no real people attached to the resumes. But they each had a name that would seem like it was ethnically identifiable in one way or another, right? So you had the best chance of getting a job according to this study. If your name was, you'll never guess what the name is. Mike. <laughs> Close. Heidi McKenzie. And you had the worst chance of getting a job if your name was Abdul Aziz Mansour, right? So it's not, it's, not ir, it's not irrational for Omar to feel this way, even though he didn't want to actually feel that way. Because I believe he felt that it also made him feel powerless that way, right? So he was confronting all of those kinds of issues. And those are the kinds of, uh, of questions that I was really, um, um, hearing and that I wanted people to, to tell me and I wanted to document. And there's, this, there's plenty of, there's plenty of um, 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 evidence for all of these things uh, in different kinds of studies. And have, there's been plenty of evidence in the years since I published the book that back up precisely those same sorts of findings. But sometimes we really need to see the human behind the evidence in order to understand the, the ways in which it affects people's lives and, and their livelihoods. And so that was one of the aims of the book and of, the, um, of being able to tell all of these different stories. And, you know, I think it's really, it's really important for our, the country to be able to tell, uh, to hear these kinds of stories and for the country to also understand them locally. I ended up basing my book in Brooklyn, New York because I thought it was really important for me to tell local stories as a way of us understanding the, and the, the, the sort of rhythms and dynamics of people's everyday lives. Right, and by doing that, I was trying to set it in a specific place. Well, I think in California, I mean, I know California is a big state. In fact, California, you might not know this, but California is the state that has, as a state, 
the largest number of Arab Americans compared to any other state in the country. Not only that, California has a rich history of Arab Americans as I was even going back to say the, the Cesar Chavez time, right? And the great uh, uh, strikes of the 1970s. Um, but, uh, and of course you have a lot of Arab Americans also who work in Silicon Valley at the same time too, um, or work um, all kinds of um, um, uh, different professions in the, in the state. But something else is happening in San Francisco these days that maybe you can tell me more about than, uh, than I can. And maybe we can, I'll end on this question and we can talk about it maybe in the Q&A. Uh, from what I'm hearing is that there's a question around whether the public school system in San Francisco should be accommodating Muslim students, not just Muslim students, but it should be recognizing the Eid holidays um, for the uh, system-wide um, in the public school system. And they had agreed eventually, they had at one point, they had uh, uh, finally agreed that they were gonna recognize the, the, the holidays. Um, and then they reneged on that agreement, the public school system. And then they agreed to do it for this year only. And then they, I guess they're gonna go back to the question around it at the same, same time. Now, <clears throat> this is a question actually that we had confronted in New York City several years ago too. And the New York City public school system now the, at the, um, not at the university level, but at the, at the elementary and high school level does recognize now the Muslim school holidays. And again, this is not necessarily an Arab question. This is more of a Muslim question, but these are overlapping categories. And I think this is an, an important issue. It's an important issue, not just for recognition, because uh, you know everybody should be recognized and everybody wants to be recognized. But the thing about our um, living in a, in a pluralistic, multi-cultural, uh, multi-ethnic, multi-faith society is understanding the kinds of rhythms that attach to everybody's lives. You know, whether we, whether we know it or not, we all live in a Christian rhythm in this culture, right? Because we get Sundays off, we get Easter off, we get Christmas off. Whether we tend to observe those or not is immaterial. So the, we understand what those holidays mean because we live in what is a, a historically Christian society or this, you know, has that background to it. In New York City, we also get a lot of the Jewish holidays off as well. So we live with the rhythms and tempos of Jewish life at the same time. So, you know, I think being able to understand the ways in which uh, we as a society live in multiple tempos and dimensions all together, I think is a way of including all of us all together. And I think it's a question that becomes uh, a really important one about how to forge a destiny uh, forward for uh, a, a very complex multi-ethnic, multi-faith and multicultural society. So I think that's actually very interesting that San Francisco is actually is having these discussions and debates right now. And I'll be watching very carefully to see exactly where they end. But I think that's about what it for my time right now. I would not want to leave enough time that we can have at least some, some questions and some discussion. And I would love to hear from you as well. So I'll turn it back to Brett. To Brett. Thank you. Musaba, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and insight and the stories and writing stories uh, about the community in Brooklyn, it, it, where you're from, in your home. And I wanna make sure that I can open it up to folks and to say, if you check the chat before we jump into the Q&A, um, I've posted the link to our post event survey. We want to hear from you. I wanna know your feedback. I work with our uh, INL department and we're gonna make the data all visually pretty to send it to Mustafa to share your feedback. So again, thank you all for that. Also, if you're interested in supporting his work, you can do so in the chat. But let's open it up. Does anybody immediately want to come off and have a question in the eight minutes that we have remaining? Does anybody have a question for our speaker? I see somebody moving. <laughs> I'll go first. I'll start us off. <laughs> so I know you said that in your book, How Does It Feel to Be a Problem? A lot of it was about documenting the stories of the youth and hearing from them and knowing what that experience was like. Why did you choose to focus on that generation of people? Why not make it folks that are of all ages? Why did why was the youth 
Why was it important to hear their stories and to frame it on how does it feel to be a problem? Yeah, thank you, Brett. I mean, I think that it's, you know, I think it's really important for young people to be able to um, figure out a place in the world. It's something that every young person confronts, right? And uh, so I thought that it was just inherently interesting to think about that at a time of, of heightened hostility. And so, you know, and what I found was really kind of fascinating because you, would, you might think that it would be logical that people would try to flee from their identities and, and what would try to find uh, refuge in, you know, saying that, oh, I'm not Arab, I'm not Muslim or what, what uh, things like that. In fact, it was the opposite. People embraced their identity because they, they kept on, there was a sense that I wanna be able to define myself and not be defined by you. And there was a lot of strength that I found in these young people while I was uh, um, you know, hanging out with them. I spent a lot of time at various Dunkin' Donuts and shisha, shisha places and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and it was, it was really, it was a kind of inspiring journey for me at the same time. Uh, and I think that you can learn a lot about how to, how to think about the fu your own future by listening carefully to how young people talk about theirs. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. I see that we have one hand raised and someone in the chat. So I'm going to go to the chat first and then I'll come back uh, to you, Audrey. Uh, so uh, Sabina wants to know who is your favorite author? And if you wouldn't mind adding why or if there's a book recommendation from your favorite author. Oh, that's a hard question to ask a literature professor. <laughs> there's too many to, to answer. And there's on so many different, um, you know, uh, are we talking fiction? Are we talking nonfiction? Are we talking um, 20th century? Are we talking, you know, it's, but I will say this, um, that I think that um, um, in my own journey, uh, I uh, was heavily influenced and I actually ended up studying under a man by the name of Edward Said. And I don't know if people are familiar with the work of Edward Said. He wrote a very famous book uh, called Orientalism. He was a, 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 a very strong Arab American and public advocate for the Palestinian cause. Um, and his work is, was tremendously informative uh, to my worldview. And, um, um, and I, you know, a lot, I ended up in working closely with him later on. And in fact, I've, I've co-edited a, a, a book of his writings, of Edward Said's writings as well. And um, if you're looking for a book of Edward Said's that uh, to read, I would either recommend his memoir called Out of Place, if you're not talking about Orientalism, which is his classic text, or another book that I think is really beautiful, probably my favorite book of his, is a, is a photo essay called After the Last Sky. And so um, those would be my recommendations. Excellent. Two great uh, recommendations after the last sky. Sabina said thank you. Audrey and then Nora. Audrey. Awesome. Thank you, Rhett. Um, and thank you so much for speaking with us today. This has uh, been so wonderful. Um, I just kind of wanted to maybe get your insight on, um, you know, through your research, through your personal experience, um, do you have any insight on dealing with that sense of feeling out of place, um, just in in any sort of environment, I guess? Well, you know, <clears throat> I think that um, uh, it's a common feeling among a lot of uh, Arab Americans and Muslim Americans, I would say. Um, and it's, um, I know among my, uh, a lot of my friends, you know, we feel out of place um, if we were to go, my family roots are from Egypt, for example. And when I go back to Egypt, I mean, I, I know Egyptian culture intimately. I've grown up with it. I know, you know the cuisine, I know the music, I know. But when I go back to Egypt, I still don't feel fully Egyptian either because I'm not, I don't live there the whole time. There's, there's a difference. And then at the same time, when I'm here in this country too, I'm constantly reminded of the ways in which I'm not just like your you know, everybody else in this country at the same time too, this sort of homogenizing effect that sometimes this country can have, which also leads to this kind of alienation, right? Or displaced, feelings of displacement. So, you know, we used to always talk about how we, you know, my friends and I, how we just have to 
find our own country, make our own country so we can just feel like we feel finally like we fully belong somewhere. Um, but, you know, I don't think that's gonna happen either. So I have to, I have to find some strength instead in this feeling of being out of place. And actually I actually think it's a place where you can, can find a lot of strength. You know, I think actually that sort of unease that, you know, of, of moving through life can give you a, a kind of lens on the world that can actually always make you question and, and wonder and see things from somebody else's point of view. And like, you're always feeling like you're looking at the world a little bit from the side. And I think that that's actually a really, a really useful and analytical place to be. And so I actually, I, I've come to, I've come to appreciate the feeling of being out of place. Thank you so much for answering that. And with our final question, no pressure. Uh, Nora, we are going to throw it to you. Thank you. It's not really a question. I just wanted to share. I think, Mustafa, thank you so much for speaking. Um, I was, I didn't live here during that 9-11. I lived in Morocco. My mom is white American. My dad's Moroccan. I got the opposite um, hate there. I just wanted to, because my mom's American, when 9-11 happened, so for some reason, it was my fault that that Bush was elected. So, you know, the, um, the bullying, the, the comments, it ha we, we got the opposite side of that. Um, I can only imagine what the, the Arab and Muslim community, hap like what happened here. We've heard stories, but um, there was hate from all different sides and uh, it was really tough and um, I just wanted to to share that part. Um, hopefully, you know, as time went on, people know more, they they understand more. Um, but I just want to thank you so much for bringing your knowledge and your writing and your um, just giving us your time with us today. Well, thank you, and thank you for your uh, for sharing your story too. And I'm sure that was not an easy time for you to to uh, uh, live through. You know, and I, it's, it now starts to feel like it was a long time ago, even though I still remember it like it was yesterday. Um, and up until, I have to say up until COVID, it, it was a part of everyday life still for, for me and I think for a lot of people. Uh, then COVID kind of took over and in the United States, they, they tend to be a focus just on one thing as well. So the war on terror kind of like held our attention for up until, you know, March 2020, and then suddenly we sort of dropped the war on terror and, and everything else moved on. But what's really dangerous, I think, is the ways in which a lot of the worst elements of the war on terror, including uh, not just the way that terrorism itself expanded globally massively, but also the ways in which, you know, um, political power grabbed for, uh, uh, more extreme positions around the world, especially you know these these sort of right wing movements around the world. I think that we see today bear a relationship to uh, the period of the war on terror as well. And so you know I I I really think that we have to understand sort of the rise of the of this dangerous right wing global movement that we're seeing today. We have to be able to connect that to our 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 past, even our recent past. Because otherwise, we're not going to get it. We're not going to get out of it. And we're so. In other words, we're still. Even though it might feel like it was a long time ago, and even though um, we need to uh, um, remember what it was like back then, we also need to still make those connections with what's going on today. If we're going to be able to have a future that we all want to live in, you know. And I think, I, I think that um, there is enough goodwill. I, I can feel it you know, from the from this room here, even virtually, that we could, we can fight back. Uh, we can have a different kind of future than that. And I think that that's the really the most important, you know, sort of moral that I hope people will, will take from today's discussion. Mustafa, thank you so much for your time and your scholarship and your energy. Um, if you would, with the final seconds remaining, will you let people know where they can find you, where they can follow your work, where they can purchase your books, um, and then we'll close out. Sure. I mean, uh, I, 
uh, on the socials, as they say, I, I am most active on Twitter, but I'm not sure Twitter is very active anymore. So, uh, but if you uh, were to look for me on Twitter, it would be, you know, at Bayumi Mustafa, just the last name first and the first name last. But you can always find me at uh, my own website. So www.moustafabayoumi.com. And you can find links there to my books and also links to, uh, to my articles. And um, in fact, I came back, I, I went to, uh, did some journalism from Guantanamo Bay last year, uh, wrote a piece on Guantanamo and I should have inshallah another piece on Guantanamo coming up, I believe next week or the week following. So if you're interested in that issue, then you can also read that. Awesome. Thank you so much. We'll have to find time to talk about the Egyptian Premier League one day. Um, I really <laughs> do appreciate each and every one of you for being here, whether you're part of the Compass Family Services team or not. I hope everybody has a fantastic day on purpose and be sure to support our speaker and his work. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.